be a little different in that we're going to like a, take a look at the passion of Mark in certain segments. I, ha I sent you a handout that had some highlighted portions. If we went line by line in the passion of Mark, it would take us a few weeks to do. But what I wanted to do is consolidate some things in this particular study to, um, to show you some strong points that Mark pulls together to give us a clear story. So um, that's how I want to take a look at this uh, to start. So Mark's gospel is, um, the passion of Mark rather, uh, Mark's gospel is the shortest of the New Testament gospels. And scholars think that it is the first one to be written. Now, the reason why we think that is because Mark's Greek is very rough. It's not polished. When you look at Matthew and Luke's uh, Greek, uh, theirs is very polished. It's cleaned up. Uh, also, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. It's S-Y-N and the word optic. What that means is similar view. So they're looking at the Jesus stories through a similar lens. Now, some of them may have some stories that others don't uh, include, but um, that's nothing to be concerned about. Uh, we look here, though, as marked being the the uh, first one, and because, as I said, it is it is the shortest. Now, when you look at Matthew and Luke, both of them use Mark's gospel in developing theirs. And what they do is what we call an exegesis. That's E-X-E-G-I-S-I-S, -I, -S, I think. E-X-E-G-I-S, -E -E yeah, exegesis. What that is is a deep dive, a deep study. <clears throat> so what you see in Matthew and Luke, their gospel is um, uh, uh, longer. And what that means is they've done some studies or some research with Mark's gospel, and they've filled in the blanks for us. You see, so Marx is the shortest, but the other two add some more. They fill in around the areas to fill in the story, uh, so to speak. So, again, um, Matthew and Luke use his gospel, but we look at his being the first. You see, so his gospel is also known as the Passion of Christ with a brief introduction. He focuses on what Christ did for us, you see. So it recounts what Jesus did for us in a very vivid style, okay? So he has a very, very strong narrative, and he stresses uh, Christ's message about the kingdom of God. And now he's breaking this into human life as good news, you see. So Jesus is the son whom God has sent to rescue humanity <clears throat> by serving and by sacrificing his life. That's that's the crux of his gospel. So let me repeat that. It's really important. Jesus is the son whom God has sent to rescue humanity by serving and by sacrificing his life. So the opening verse about good news in Mark serves as a title for the entire book. The action begins with the appearance of John the Baptist which for some would think that that would be unusual, that that's exactly where he starts his, but it's with John the Baptist. The Passion account, with its condemnation of uh, Jesus by the Sanhedrin and the sentencing with Pilate, is prefaced with the entry into Jerusalem. And then we go through the rest of the story, uh, the rest of the um, how the story unfolds. Okay, So <clears throat> that's how I plan on doing it. Uh, I hope you've had it all had a chance to take a look at the um, the handout. Hopefully, look through it, read through it briefly. Uh, I wanted you to see that so that we're not going to, as I said, we're not going to stop at every line. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions or comments on what we're going to cover or how we're going to cover it? Everybody's cool. Okay. So let's take a look at the first line here. He opens up with the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He identifies two feasts, two separate feasts. Now, eventually, those feasts get joined into one, as, the, as what we know as the Passover. But look what he does here. He's setting the timeline for us. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread 
were to take place in two days' time. So he gives us a narrow frame, but look what he says in the next sentence. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest him by treachery. Highlight that word treachery. That's important. Mark wants his community to know that <clears throat> this was sneaky. This was underhanded. This was done under the table. This was done in the dark. There was nothing honest about this, which is why he uses the word treachery. Right. So these men that were planning in the background are really evil men. <clears throat> They're not saying, well, you know, Jesus did this and this. We really need to talk about him. There's a uh, um, a sneakiness to this. There's a um, uh, one of the Gospels uses the word stealth. You know, uh, they were looking to arrest him by stealth. So the words they use are very strong because they want the people to know that Jesus did nothing wrong. And yet this, the chief priests and the scribes were meeting um, behind the scenes, meeting at night, meeting when ordinary, you know, the ordinary daylight would not shine on what they're going to do. And why were they doing this? They wanted to put him to death. Okay. That's his opening line. So that's a real powerful opening line. It tells you right where he's going, right? He gives you a timeline of two days, which means... The chief priests and the scribes have a narrow window to work in. So they've really got to get their act together. Okay. And the reason for that is he closes that by the second verse. They said, not during the festival, for fear there may be a riot among the people. What they see here is that Jesus is very popular among the people. And the riot is a serious issue because, as we have, may have spoken in our previous uh, Bible studies, if you looked at the construction of the temple area, the temple area is sitting in one large, large, large square, but towering above it is a complex called the Antonia Fortress. And that's where the Roman soldiers are, maybe 10,000, 20,000 soldiers. We don't know the exact count, but they can oversee what's going on in the temple area. So if a riot were to take place, they would crush the Jews in a matter of minutes. So they're fearful. They don't want to riot because they don't want the, the Romans coming down on them because the Romans would have destroyed everything. You see, so they're very so fearful. So not during this festival. Now, the festival brings in a few million people. That's the other side of this. So it's not like a couple of dozen people show up you know, for a, a little bit of a party, you have a few million people in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. So if there's a riot there, this is going to be a real bad scene. And the Romans will put the riot down very, very fast. So they have to do this very quietly. And as I said before, very sneakily. They can't, they can't let their work be seen. It's all, it's all behind the scenes. Okay? Any questions on that? Deacon Dan, yes. Not really a question, but it does kind of, it is interesting. And when you really stop and set that stage, it really does put together this more, the passion, right? This idea of what they did and how this wasn't just like, oh, let's just arrest them now moment. You know what I mean? Like this is really in-depth thought process of how this was going to occur, which then leads it to more like, wow, they were really out to get him. Like, you know, they were really out to get Jesus. This wasn't just like, oh, I'm mad at him. Let's just get him off the street. It really puts that level of the pain and suffering he was going to inflict. This was a well thought out scheme. I don't know. I, I've always gone through this, but the more you're breaking it down, it's like, wow, this was like treachery. What? And, and why? Well, you see, Jesus is a humble man. He's coming through the Galilee, healing people forgiving sins, you know, doing all these wonderful things that the Messiah would do. Um, he's upsetting the lifestyle. So if the crowds follow him, and the crowds are very poor people, what happens? The lifestyle of the chief priests and the scribes change dramatically. Dramatically. And so they don't want, they're living pretty well, by the way. They're doing quite well. 
So they don't want their lifestyle to change. So what do they have to do? They have to get rid of the one thing that's upsetting the apple cart. And that's Jesus. Lauren, yes. But isn't this all part of God's plan? I mean, something has to happen that Jesus is uh, put to death, right? Yes, it is part of the plan. But the interesting thing here is never forget, we all have the gift of free will. So even though Jesus had to die to save us, all right, these chief priests and the scribes could have thought of other ways to do things because they have free will. But again, they use their free will to turn against Jesus and they're weighing both things. We'll get into more of this when we talk about Pilate. They're looking at, well, if we, if Jesus becomes stronger, this is what happens to him and he's way up here. This is what happens to us and we're way down here. We have to get this balance back up. And so the only way to do this is to eliminate him. He has to be eliminated. But isn't that the plan, that he has to die for our sins? Yes, he has to die for our sins. That's the plan. That's the, the way We call that the, uh, the um, salvific work of Christ, okay, or the plan of salvation. That was announced back in Genesis, okay? God laid his plan out in Genesis. But we're looking at here, we're looking at the attitudes of the people, okay? And how did the people view this? And what were they doing? Uh, and the key thing here is to see the depth of the planning that took place for this. Well, what would the alternative have been? Everybody would have to uh, change their ways and, and not sin anymore? Well, it would have been wonderful if everybody accepted Jesus and his teachings. Yeah, there would have been no need for them to die. But that's not the case. It's also not the plan. Somebody has to repay the debt. If, if they would have accepted him as he was and let him continue teaching then everything would have been fine and he wouldn't have had to yeah, die. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. But just his teachings were so radical for the time that it was going to change, as I said, change the lifestyle of these guys who um, just the fact by the fact that Mark uses the word treachery tells you that these aren't the most honest guys in the, in the box in the first place. All right. Uh, we have history through scripture of how they took advantage of the people and they, they, made the laws so difficult for the people to follow. Jesus even says this, you've given them a heavy burden, but you haven't put the burden on yourself, you see? So you have this group of uh, unsavory people, all right, involved in this planning, in this moving this forward, okay? But they're sharp enough to know, let's not cause a riot. Because what happens is the riot squashes everything. So this has got to be done behind the scenes. Any other questions or comments on this? Okay, we switch now to this anointing at Bethany, which is an important story here. Okay. I hopefully you've all read that first line. Does anybody want to say anything before we pull that part, that line apart? Okay, let's take a look at this. He's reclining at table. Now, when they ate back in the day, um, if you could picture a wagon wheel with spokes, okay, the center of the wheel would be where all the food was. When they say reclining at table, they were actually laying down on pads or whatever, okay? So their feet would be at the bottom and their head and hands would be at the top where they would be able to get their food, all right? We say that because uh, in some of the stories when the, uh, the woman anoints his feet, she didn't crawl onto the table to anoint his feet. His, his feet had to be exposed somehow. So if you look at that wagon wheel, it gives you a good idea, you see. But look at what happens here. Reclining at the table in the house of who? Simon the leper. Mark makes it a point to say that because that would never happen. Jesus would never go into the house of a leper. Now, uh, we, we uh, uh, can understand here that Simon had been cured because he wouldn't have been allowed to be in the regular population, but Jesus would never associate with a leper. But Mark makes it a point to show that where does Jesus go? He goes to the house of Simon the leper. So that's one 
scene he sets for us. But now even a more powerful scene here in these words. A woman comes with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil. Alabaster in the day was extremely expensive. So the jar in and of itself is quite costly. And it's perfumed oil. But then he goes on to tell us what the oil is. Costly? Genuine spike nard. Some scripture would just call it nard. Now, she's come there for a reason. She's come there to make her a total sacrifice to Jesus. Now, where do we pick that up? She broke the alabaster jar. That's the beginning of her sacrifice. She breaks the jar, which means she cannot repair it. So this very expensive jar, she breaks and poured the oil, the very expensive oil, on his head. Now, aside of the fact that she's anointing him, this is a total sacrifice for this woman. Because she, as I said, she broke the jar. She can't repair it. And now she's pouring all the oil on his head, which means she can't soak it back up in a sponge and squeeze it into something and save it. This is a total sacrifice that this woman is making. And as we read the next couple of verses, we'll see exactly what kind of a sacrifice it was because the disciples become indignant a waste of the perfumed oil. But look how much it cost. It's more than 300 days wages. So this is a tremendous sacrifice that she's making. And verse 5 says, they were infuriated with her because the money could have been to the poor, given to the poor. And Jesus sets them straight. Let her alone. Why do you make trouble? She's done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. And then he closes this up by saying, she has done what she could. She's anticipated anointing my body for burial. And what we're doing today, reading and in, remembering this in scripture, is verse 9. Whenever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. This will never be forgotten. This total sacrifice that she uh, made for him. That no one else in the room understood. So this little scene that we have of this anointing, is, as you can see, is far more important than just eh, that she anointed Jesus. Yes, she did. She anointed him for burial. But this is a total sacrifice that this woman has made. The cost of everything, the cost of the, uh, of the oil and the cost of the jar. And she gives it all to Jesus in a way that she can never take any of it back. Have any questions on this? Okay, Mark inserts that story because it's an important story. It's an important story of sacrifice because she recognizes who he is and she goes in and does this uh, anointing, okay, which he says uh, he's an, she's anointing him for burial, which keep in mind now, they still don't understand this. He makes good, you know, all through his conversations, he's been saying, you know, the son of man must be killed and whatnot. They're not getting it, you know. And even when he says he'll be raised in three days, they're not, they're, they're not on that page yet. Okay. But this woman is. Deacon Michael. Okay. Yes. It is interesting that like when you do these types of readings, this law is like, it is important that I found in talking is, you know, we're looking at, this story from 2024 right we've had scholars and theologians but these people are living it out in the moment and there's a lot of stuff they're not getting you know and this is a lot of this is like this woman comes out and breaks this jar and they're sitting there like what are you doing yeah but now, is, other, and i what? guess for me i'm just i'm just pointing out that point you made it is a really good one because it's like 
you can't look at it like you always said through the lens right human hermeneutics you can't look at it from now you gotta look at it from then what they're going through you know this is you got the people planning treachery and they don't even really know why they just know that they got to get rid of him because he's messing up their life you got this woman who's like i see something in this this is real they got the people getting indignant at her but it's like a really a pushing a pull battle going on right now you know but it's a good point it is, it is and also keep in mind they would have been unless she was a someone waiting on them serving food the men are in one room and the women would be in another so for a woman to come into here is a shocker as well so the whole scene is a shock this woman enters where she should not and she's not entering to serve them bread or whatever She's coming in and she's doing this anointing. Lauren. It seems that it's the women that understand Jesus much better than the men. Yes, yeah, it's true. The women understand, but also the um, the average person in some instances, as we get up to the passion, no, because of what goes on, but uh, in his teachings, the average people get him when his disciples don't. We see that time and time again. They're just because it'll say, and Jesus took them off privately and explained it to them, you know, just in case, hey guys, just in case you didn't get this, let me give it to you a slower version. You know, he takes them aside to teach them even more, you see. So they're not always catching it. You see that in the story of the transfiguration. They come down from the mountain and they don't know what to make of this at all. They haven't got a clue. You know, so Jesus just says, be quiet, don't say anything. But throughout sacred scripture, you, you see where the 12 uh, don't always get it, you know. And there's one verse uh, that, uh, or one passage where Jesus gives this whole discourse. And Peter says, is that for us? You know, and I could, you know, with a little bit of humor, I could picture Jesus like knocking his head against the tree saying, how many times do I have to tell these people? You know, yeah, this is for you. Come over here, you know. Um, and he even says a few times, how long are you going to be with me before you get it, before you get the message? So the, the 12 don't always get it. They don't always get it. But you're right. The common people in some instances do. And the women, these women we're talk that we're talking about are women that have followed him in his ministry through Galilee or through the Galilee, as they call it. OK, they followed him and they uh, they worked within the ministry. You see, so they're very close to Jesus and follow him into, you know, in, into this period here. So, yes, uh, and at the end of it, when we get to the end of the gospel here, we'll see that um, only a, a few women hang behind. You know, but let's go into the anybody, any other questions or comments before we. Um... OK, let's look at this betrayal, because there's some clues here. What do you does anything jump out uh, at you in verse 10? He can then the, the fact that he was one of the 12, you know, he was yeah. one of the chosen by Jesus. If you're reading this, you know, and you're just reading, you're reading this like you would read us any story. And it says, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12. Now you can put, put, put in parentheses for yourself. It's one of the 12. Can you believe it? It's one of the 12 that he picked. That's the shocker for anybody reading this. That's why he clarifies this. It's not like, Judas Iscariot, a disciple, one of the 12. He's one of the handpicked from Jesus. So it's like, can you believe it? One of the 12 went off to the chief priests to hand him over to them. You see, so that one of the 12 is really key here. Mark wants everyone to understand that Jesus picked this person. Okay, he's one person that was picked. They promised to pay him money. What does that tell you? He enters into an arrangement with them. Deacon Dan, go ahead. I was just going to say the beginning of the treachery. <laughs> the sneakiness. Yeah. It's the beginning of it. It's the, the beginning of it. They, they, he enters into an agreement. And because he now has enter, 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 entered into an agreement, we have the, the, uh, the second part of that verse. Then he looked for an opportunity. The agreement's in place. So now he has to go out and fulfill the agreement. Okay, so they offered to pay him money. He agreed. Now he has to go and fulfill the contract or the agreement, if you will. 
So you see this whole thing of treachery coming in very quickly. He, what, when does he meet them? He meets them in the dead of night. He meets them behind the scenes, behind the curtain, however you want to say it, behind the wall, whatever you, whatever picture you want to um, to paint of that, you see. And they enter into an arrangement of some sort. They're going to pay him some money. Now he feels responsible to go out and hand them over because he's entered into a deal. Okay. Any other questions or comments on that? Okay, let's look at the preparation for the Passover. We see again a timeline on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And again, uh, Lauren is talking about a plan. Yeah, we see the plan here. And I'm not going to go over all of these, you know, up to, from 13 to 16. Uh, he lays it out as to what's going to happen. This plan is in place. Now, the key thing that this shows us is that Jesus is in charge. Jesus is in charge from verse 12 to 16. We see it. He has it all laid out. It's all taken care of. Every T is crossed and every I is dotted. It's ready to go. And that's an important uh, element about the entire passion story. At no time does Jesus give up control. He's in control of everything. So he's now laying out how the Passover is to be set up. Okay. Now let's look at the betrayer. Look at 17, and what do we see in 17? Again, evening in the dark. Evening. When it was evening, nothing in daylight. The sun's not shining on this. When it was evening, he comes with who? The twelve. He comes with the 12. Now, in other verses of scripture, you will read he was with his disciples. That could be 20,000 people. A disciple is somebody who's following a teacher. But here again, the focus is very narrow. When it was evening, he comes with the 12. And then we have this reference to this reclining at table. Now, take a look at that verse, okay? And see what jumps out at you there. What do you see there? He says, amen, I say to you. Now, what does that mean to you? Listen up. Listen up. You got it. Good, good going. Yes. Amen, I say to you. That's a, put your coffee cup down. I got something to say. Okay, and whenever we see that, amen, we know that whatever he's going to say is going to be extremely powerful. And look at what he says. I say to you, one of you will betray me. Okay, okay, that's one of you, one of you will betray me. But here's the line, one who is eating with me. At that point, it could be anybody. He doesn't identify the person. He says, someone at this table is going to be betray me. Which is why you have verse 19. They all become distressed. Like, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? So they all become distressed. Is it me? Is it I? Surely it's not I. So then he says to them, the one who dips with me into the dish. So the person who dips into the dish at the time is going to the, be the one who is going to betray him. Now, your operative word here, by the way, is um, it's he's talking in the present tense here, or actually the future, the one who it's going to happen. In other words, it hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. 
the one who dips with me into the dish. So it's going to happen, which of course causes all of this um, uh, conversation. You know, who is it? Who could it be? What's the deal here? So then he goes into another explanation. Jesus is always teaching. So if you listen to him, he's always teaching. For the Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him. So what he's doing there is he's fulfilling a prophecy. And as we've said in the past, when you read the Old Testament, you are reading through a lens because what is prophesied in the Old Testament will be fulfilled by Jesus in the New. So he says, it is written, which means this has been prophesied. But then he puts the warning out. Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. Now, this is also his... Um, is uh, saying it would be better for him that he, he would not have been born. The key thing about this is that this is a common Jewish, Jewish curse at the time. It's a common Jewish curse at the time. So he puts out this very stern warning. Meanwhile, causes a lot of confusion at the table because not that they're wondering who would betray him but like for what reason you know why would they do this and what is this betrayal what's the form of the betrayal they're still not getting you know he talks about the son of man dying they're still not on the same page with this yet so they're still not on the same page yes amy when you read this slowly, you can really see the progression. You know, it's a, okay, somebody's going to betray me. And, you know, which sounds bad, but there's different levels of betrayal, you know, and then you go through and then everyone's distressed, like, well, wait, who, you know, who is it? And then he says, well, this is how it's going to happen. And then he like puts the exclamation point at the end saying like, this is like very severe betrayal, like of the worst kind ever. And you know, like, so you, until you read that slowly, you know, you, you can really see that progression there. Yes, you can. And what you have here, too, you have these 12 men in formation with Jesus. OK, the deacons and deacon candidates understand this, this formation. You go through this period of being taught and being formed into ministry. So you have these 12 men who have uh, followed Jesus to the letter. So the word betrayal is like, wait a minute. I mean, what can I have possibly done? I've done every single thing he wanted me to do. I've been with him. I've helped him. I've done whatever. You know, we fed the poor. We, what is this betrayal? They're not quite getting a grip on what this is. But betrayed him how and to who? Who were they betraying him to? So these are 12 men that have followed him day by day, night by night in formation. And they're being formed. You see, so they're looking at him through that form. Take Judas aside for a moment, okay? Uh, I like Judah, I like Luke's gospel where it says, Satan has entered him. If we were doing Luke's gospel, that gives you a real powerful uh, view here. You know, uh, where it didn't say Satan entered all of them. It says Satan had entered Jesus, uh, Judas, rather, you know, which is your change. But sticking here for a moment, you have these men who have followed formation to the letter. Now, if we were looking at today, Sacrament of Holy Orders, for example, the men who finally get to the end of their order, or their formation period, they are ordained for ministry. That's where the guys are, right? They've done everything he said. So now you get this total shock. Somebody's betrayed him. And so they're totally, they're confused by the conversation, but even more so, they're confused about which one of them that has been following him so faithfully now has turned against him and in what way and nobody knows that's why you have this this mumbling you see this mumbling and this this grumbling okay so we move now into the lord's supper now this is beautiful here because 
you actually see the establishment of our liturgy here. It's not Deacon, just... Yes. I have, a, I have a question. Yes. Before you go on. Wouldn't everybody be watching that dish when Jesus puts his to see who is going to be the betrayer? Well, it could be, but it doesn't mean that, keep in mind the way the food was there, it's almost like on a, it's almost like a big lazy Susan. So people could be reaching all together. So it doesn't identify the one person, you say. It doesn't say like, oh, I'm going to put, I'm going to dip in the dish now and the, the hand that goes in with me does it. No, it's not identifiable that way, you see. Okay. So, so it, again, someone at the table there who's eating with him, who has, is going to put his hand in the dish is it. But they're all going to do it. So it could be anybody at that time. Okay. okay. There's more than one dish. Yeah. Yeah. Again, okay. The whole dinner is set out there, you see. And so they're kind of, they, you know, they're, it, 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 visually, it looks like they're casually eating dinner. But that's when they, it talks about, you know, they reclined for dinner. Yeah, that was the style. And so all the food is there for them to reach out, okay, and grab the food. And it's still done that way there now. In, the, in, in many parts of the country, it's done like that, where the food is put all on the table, and then you just reach out and you take whatever you want to take. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so now we look here, while they were eating. So they're eating, okay? They're reaching in, they're taking whatever they want to take here. You know, now we see this, he took bread. And what does he do? They're all seated, okay? Said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. Now, this is a... Um, This is a, 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 a view of the heavenly banquet, seating around the table, sitting around the table with the Lord, okay, together, sitting with him, sharing with him. And he says, take it. This is my body. And they take it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, of the covenant, of the relationship. Okay, this is my blood of the relationship that we have, which will be shed for many. Now, there are four cups in the Seder meal. That's what this next reference is. Amen, I say to you. There we go. Right? I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He doesn't drink the fourth cup. And then we have, and I love it when I when when I get a chance to preach this particular gospel after singing a hymn. They went to the Mount of Olives. And whenever I get to preach that particular verse, I remind the people that Jesus didn't leave the table of the Lord until after he sang the last hymn of praise. And so you shouldn't be running out the door of the church until the last hymn of praise to God is sung. He sets it for us right there. And I've done that, as I said, it this cycles every few years and when it when it's my turn to preach, the people know what's coming, because I usually close the homily with that kind of a reference. That no, the meal was not over until the last hymn of praise was sung, and then he goes out to the Mount of Olives, which was his custom to go out to the Mount of Olives. Any questions on this so far? Okay. It's pretty straightforward uh, as to what he's doing. And as you, as, as I said, we see here, our liturgy is right here. Okay, our liturgy, the sharing of the Eucharist is right here, you know, for us to, to see. And it's Jesus 
who does this. He institutes the, um, the, the, the Eucharist. He institutes the Eucharist for us. I can see where the apostles could be confused. We know what's going to happen in a couple of days. They don't. Whenever he says, I'm going to die, they don't know if it's going to happen next week, next year, or 30 years from now. They That's don't right. really get that. So when you put yourself that way, then you see, well, yeah, they could be confused. And they're like, wait a minute, you know, he's talking about death. She's going to bury me. Well, I don't know when he's going to be buried. We don't know this. That We know it's going to take place. So we have to take that like out of our mind to get us back to where they were. That's correct. It's a good point. You have to stay within the verses that you're reading. Don't read ahead into this. Because when you stay within the verses, you can see the confusion that they have. You can see the confusion in their conversation. All right. You can see them struggling with themselves. They're not quite getting a grip on this. They're not understanding this. But the night is, if anything, the night is mysterious. If anything, the night is mysterious. Okay. And they're not, they're just not figuring it out. But there's just something unsettling. This isn't the normal Passover. He's saying certain things. He's doing different things. Um, and it's just unnerving to them. They can't get a grip on it. But somewhere along the line, one of them has done something that's going to flip the tables upside down. So just by injecting that in the beginning of the conversation, it's not a comfortable dinner. It's not a comfortable dinner. Something's wrong. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's take a look at uh, uh, Peter's denial foretold. Jesus said to them, all of you will have your faith shaken. That's why I said, understand what's going on at the table now. They're not being, they're not sitting there talking about the Steelers. He's throwing some heavy stuff at them. And he's saying, your faith is going to be shaken. And what does he do there? For it is written. He tells us there's another prophecy here. And the prophecy says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed. So picture yourself at the table. Like, what is he talking about? You know, what's the, you know, what's going to shake our faith? And now you get the real line. After I am raised up. This is called a divine passive. Okay, if you're looking at the ancient language, okay. What does that mean? It's implied that God is doing the raising up. Okay. After I have been raised up. Well, somebody's going to raise him up. Who is it? God is going to raise him up. Now, it's a little ambiguous here because he could be meaning that the resurrection when he's raised from the dead. Or if you remember back in Moses with the serpent, when they had the snake, they made the bronze snake. He could be saying, when I am raised up on the cross, because if you recall the story of Moses, anyone that looked up at the snake was healed. Anyone who looks up at the cross is saved. See, so again, you have this, it's a little ambiguous there, but the key thing here is that God is doing the raising up. Okay. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. In other words, I will meet you in Galilee after this is all done. So now we have Peter. And we can all thank God that Peter became the head of the church. Because Peter is the one that stumbles and falls and gets up and stumbles and falls and gets up, just like any of us. You know, he's not the the uh, man of perfection that does everything right. You know, I, I I often said that if John was made the pope, I think that would be a little nerve wracking because John, throughout sacred scripture, is perfection. Peter is, you know, he has to take his foot out of his mouth before he talks because he's always going to say something that's going to uh, has to be corrected. 
you know. And so he says here, even though all should have their faith shaken, mine will not be. And what does Jesus say? We get the amen again. In other words, hey Peter, put your put your coffee cup down. I got a news. I got news for you here. You know, you know. Amen. I say to you, this very night, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. Okay. So again, this very night. Notice the night comes in again. This is all going to happen at night. Okay. Now, night begins at sunset, by the way. Night begins at sunset. So sometime after sunset, you see, this is going to happen. So the Passover, if night begins at sunset, the Passover, again, uh, uh, highlights a new day. But our focus here is, he says point blank, this very night, this is what's going to happen. And he says it very, very strongly. But what does Peter do? Comes right back at him, as we said a few moments ago. Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And everybody agrees. Hey, here, here. Yeah, we're all the same. That's fine. So no matter what, I'm not going to deny you. We get into the garden. Garden of Gethsemane today is, is, is so powerful. It's such a powerful place to be because those olive trees that are still standing there are from Christ's time. And it's to stand in that garden is just, it, it's, it, it's shocking because you're right there, right where Jesus was. He might have leaned on some of the trees. As a matter of fact, one of the trees they have um, gated off that they believe that that is one of the original, original trees that may, maybe he did lean on it. And it's actually gated off so nobody can go over and touch it or do anything with it. So we look at the verse 12 here. Then they came to a place called Gethsemane. The Gospels don't refer to this as a garden, but it is. They come to a place called Gethsemane. And he says, to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Now, the key thing here is in verse 33. He takes within Peter, James, and John. These are these are, are, are um, referenced as the pillars of the church. It's always Peter, James, and John that he takes. And he became uh, begins to be troubled. And he's distressed and he turns to them and he says my soul is sorrowful even to death remain here and keep watch now he separates himself now we can only uh, uh, assume that the remaining disciples are probably in a cave all right a lot of caves on the Mount of Olives and they're probably off there sitting there waiting for him because you know, it's, it's, it's nighttime now. It's cool. It's damp. They probably uh, took shelter in a cave. And it's believed that that's what Jesus did, too, because uh, he was on the Mount of Olives all the time. And he probably took refuge in a cave rather than sleep outside under the damp sky. So they're probably off somewhere, you know, waiting. So he walks away. He fell to the ground and prayed. He fell to the ground. This is key. We see in a lot of the movies, Jesus kneeling in the garden, praying. Jews don't kneel. That's not, a, that, that's not what they do. He falls to the ground then. So he lays prostrate on the ground and prays that if it was possible, this hour could pass by him. He's feeling the weight of what's about to happen. And so here, we look at 36. This is a powerful verse here. He said, Abba, Father. Abba translates as Daddy. So he's praying as a child to his father. And he throws this back at him and says, all things are possible to you. In other words, you could do this if you want. 
take this cup away from me. Take this cup away from me. But not what I will, but what you will. Now, again, if you read the other gospels, you read a more detailed uh, story of what goes on in Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a powerful scene in the Passion. Because when he cries out like this, take this from me. It has been revealed to him what is going to, what the power of sin is. Luke makes, re makes reference that he actually sweat blood. The stress was so great that he actually sweat blood. And I make reference to this in, the, in my book that what happens there is the blood goes into the sweat glands and is extremely painful. Is extremely painful. He's wrestling. He's fighting. With who? His divinity is wrestling with his humanity. His hu humanity is saying, no, I don't want to do this. I've seen this. And it says, I, I don't want to do it. Take it away. You can do this. His divinity is saying, you have to accept the divine plan. Now, the beauty of, of verse 36 is that at that moment when he says that, his humanity has joined with his divinity. And he says, not what I want. It's your will. And so that wrestle, that struggle, that fight, which again is extreme. It's the two natures battling each other in the garden. Any questions on that? Any comments on that? Yes, Angela. So I have heard that before about that Jesus is in that moment taking on all of the sin of humanity and that he is seeing it and he's experiencing it. Mm -hmm. but how do we know that? Because that's not that's never in the text directly. Like what I, the, what I with why I look at this is as he's going through his ministry, okay. Um, I view this almost like Alexio Divina. Slowly but surely, his mission is being revealed to him. And I say that because I get a lot of questions that, did Jesus know when he was a year old, he was going to the cross? Yeah. He didn't say to Mary at two years old, well, you know, I got 31 more years, mom, and I'm out of here. No. You know, so I believe that it was kind of like a Alexio Divina. And also, one of the theologians, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who's a very, he was uh, Pope John Paul II's uh, personal theologian. He makes a reference that when Jesus went into the Jordan to get baptized and he submerged in the Jordan. Now, keep in mind, the Jordan held all the sins of the people because that's when they went in to get baptized. It was the baptism of repentance. When he came out of the water, all those sins or attached to him. And so as he goes through his ministry, he's distancing himself little by little by little. And that's where we get to that, my God, my God, why you have you forsaken me? That powerful uh, psalm that he prays, okay? He feels the results of sin, which is the total separation from God. So when he gets into the garden, okay, and again, I'm going, I'm, 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 I'm referencing a few, quite a few theologians say that as he's praying in the, this is revealed to him. He sees what the power of sin is going to do. Now, keep in mind that Jesus has perfect love with the father, agape love. And he sees that sin is going to break it. He can't take it. He sees it's going to break it. It's so painful. It's horrifying to him. To see this now, there's a beautiful painting of uh, of this um, where Jesus is on the cross and he's looking out over a blackened world, which is shows sin, all right, and he feels abandoned. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he can't see behind him, and behind him is God the Father holding the cross, meaning that he never left him alone. But he had to feel this separation, you see. He had to feel the power of sin. So as scripture says, he was made sin for us. He had to feel the power of sin. He had to feel that separation. See? And that's what's happening in the garden. 
So it's revealed to him when he goes off and prays, and he goes off three times to pray. This is revealed to him. And he's saying, no, you can change this. Do it. Change it. Take it away. So, so he returns to them now, and he finds them asleep. And he says, Simon, are you asleep? Notice the dirt. He's Simon he's talking to. He doesn't say, are the three of you asleep? Simon. We call that, again, another way of identifying what we call the primacy of Peter. Peter's the leader. He addresses Peter. He doesn't say, you know, Peter, James, and John, what are you doing sleeping? Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Then we have 38. Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The test. Now, if your mind goes back to Job, remember the test in Job? What was happening there? Satan was testing him. Satan was testing to see if he was truly loyal to God. So he's saying, don't open yourself to this. Pray that you won't undergo the test. And then he says that the spirit is willing. He knows in their hearts they want to stay awake, but the flesh is weak. Now, they just had a meal. They drank some wine. They're off in the garden. They're drowsy, they're sleepy, you know, but he knows that in their heart of hearts, the spirit is willing. And look what he does in 39. Withdrawing again, he prayed, saying the same thing. The struggle is still going on. The battle is still going on. And then he returns once more. And it says here, they could not keep their eyes open and did not know what to answer him. Here, they're embarrassed. Because he just warned them, stay awake. He comes back there and what do you say? You know, we promised we would stay awake. We're here for you. You know, And now, here we are sleeping again. And then in, in 41 is when we get the, um, uh, the count. He returned a third time. So he went off three times right, to pray. And he says, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. Now, we've talked about that word before. When Jesus is about to change the subject, he will say, enough. I've heard enough. We're moving on to this. So what does he say here? It is enough. We're done with this here. I'm done speaking to the Father. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. So now, when we finally get to go to the Holy Land again, okay, and you take a look at the, and you're standing in the garden, you can see that at this particular time, the only thing Jesus can see in the garden are torches coming toward him. That's all you can see. So he has all of these olive trees and all of this foliage, and it's nighttime. So the only thing he can see are the sinners snaking their way through the trails to get to him in the garden. And he says, get up. Let's go. My betrayer is at hand. Now, again, I mentioned before that Jesus is in total control. Bethany, if he took one of the one of the trails that's in the that's on the Mount of Olives, he could be in Bethany in a short period of time. It's only two miles away. You see. So he could have escaped by one of those trails, but he does not. As I said, his his divine will and his human will have joined. And he stays and he waits. Any questions about that? I hope what's happening is you can feel the terror of the night. This is all at night. The terror of the night. And what's going on. So, we look at the betrayal. 
And again, Mark writes, he's very sudden, you know, here we, then, okay. In other words, okay, if they, all this other stuff is finished, then we're into the next scene here. Then, while he was still speaking, Judas, notice what he does. One of the 12, just in case you didn't get it before, let me tell you, this is somebody that Jesus picked on his own. Arrived, and he's accompanied now with a crowd, with a crowd. They've got swords and clubs and whatever, but look at where they're from. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. There's a representation of all of them that come. Now, his betrayer had arranged a signal. The man I shall kiss is the one. And he gives the order, arrest him and lead him away securely. Arrest him and lead him away securely. So he came and immediately went over to him and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Now, this kiss isn't just an ordinary kiss. If you notice on TV, uh, the Europeans, if you if you if you greet them, they give you a little peck on one cheek, a little peck on the other cheek. Okay, that's a kiss of greeting. Judas gives him an intimate kiss. Okay, not the standard kiss of hi, this is who you are. He gives him a, a, a kiss that you would give to a special person, okay? A special, a relative comes. You give them that little extra hug, you know? That's the power of the kiss that he gives, see? That's the power that he gives. Not just a little peck on either, hey, this is him, I'm going through a motion. No, he gives him a very, very per personal kiss. And then they laid hands on him and arrested him. So we go into the story of so the bystanders, drew his sword, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. Jesus talks to them. Did, did you come to arrest a robber? You come with swords and clubs? But look at 49. Day after day, I was with you, teaching. I was teaching in the temple area, yet you didn't arrest me. Which meant he wasn't teaching anything that was blasphemous. But look at what the next uh, few words say. But that the scriptures may be fulfilled. Again, he's fulfilling a prophecy from the Old Testament. And they all left him and fled. Remember, he said, when the you know the, 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 their faith would be challenged, here you have it. Now, a young man followed, followed him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him. You know, some scholars say this is John Mark, but it doesn't identify who he is. But he left the cloth behind and ran off naked. What's the symbolism there? He leaves the cloth behind and ran off naked. The protection is gone. Jesus who protected them is gone. So the linen cloth is left behind. That's, again, symbolically, they take Jesus away. Their protection is gone. So it's not just that the cloth fell off. Right, there's a there's a, a a symbolic understanding there, and the garden scene is over. Any questions or comments? Okay, Michael, can I make yes, a comment? Yes, sure. Uh, the wording of the um the betrayal and arrest of Jesus and even leading up to it 
they just keep repeating that phrase, my betrayer, the, the betrayer. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they do say Judas as well, but I just think it's interesting because it reminds you that you can feel all chosen and following God and that you're one of Jesus's disciples, but you need to keep in mind that yes, he did call you and he also called Judas. And mm -hmm. so don't go off assuming that you're one of the 11, like mm -hmm. assume that we all have that in us to betray Jesus and to always keep on your guard. Um, and it reminds me of the uh, parable about the seeds in the soil, how Jesus said, some seeds will grow roots and yeah. some will blow away and all of that. And Pastor Rick Warren said, I, he used to read it as I think everybody, most people do that, oh, I'm the seed that grew roots. I'm the seed that's growing in Christ. You know, those people are the seeds that blew away or that, you know, burned up because they weren't serious. He said, no, he's like throughout the day, each one of us, it can be each one of those seeds, you can't. Right. I just thought that the humility behind that was so extraordinary mm -hmm. because I think some people who are faithful fall into the trap of thinking that they just, they lose their humility. They assume that they, they their self-righteousness is based on themselves, not God. So and you, hit, you hit the nail on the head there because what does Jesus tell him in the garden? Pray that you don't fall into the test. Oh, right. That's exactly what you're talking about. That's yes. exactly what you're talking about. Pray that you don't fall into the test. The trap. You use the word trap. It's the same thing. The test. So you're right. All of us, you know, well, we're, you know, we're followers of Jesus and we do this and we do that and we do the other. However, that trap, that test is always out there. It's always out there waiting to pull us. And again, Mark calls him the betrayer because Mark is hammering home what he is. He's hammering home what he is. He is the betrayer. Good points. Anybody else have anything to add there? Okay. So they take him before the Sanhedrin. And what I highlighted in these verses is that their testimony did not agree. What does that mean? In the culture of the day, if someone was to testify against you, you had to have two people and their testimony had to agree. If it didn't agree, it was false testimony. Not only that, if you were found to be lying in your testimony, then you would receive the same fate as the criminal. So if you were found to be lying in this particular situation, you would be crucified right along with Jesus. Well, we don't see that happen, which tells us that this is, this is a false trial with a capital F. And verse 57 says, some took the stand and testified falsely against him. And their testimonies did not agree. But we look at 58. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple. Now, here's your words here. Made with hands. And within three days, I will build another not made with hands. Okay. Totally. They, they got to be standing there saying, what is this? What is he talking about? What is he talking about? See? And it says, even so, their testimony did not agree. They did not realize he was talking about the temple of his body. Just as our bodies are referred to as, as temples. We are tabernacles of the Lord. When we receive communion, we are a living tabernacle of the Lord, walking through town, walking through earth, walking through our day-to-day -day, um, lives with Jesus within us. Just as Mary was the living tabernacle, carried the living Ark of the Covenant, as she carried the living Word of God within her. And uh, 61 tells us, he's silent and says nothing. Absolutely silent. He didn't have to say anything, you see. By law, he didn't have to say a word. They had to prove their case. And then 
Again, the high priest asked him and said, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Now we see in 62, he answers them, which is kind of unusual because he doesn't say anything throughout this entire trial. But in the translation, you see, the high priest uses the word adjure, A-D-J-U-R-E, I adjure you. In other words, he's saying, I'm putting you under oath. The minute that happens, he has to answer. So the high priest says, I'm putting you under oath. Are you the Messiah? Then he answers them. And he says, yeah, I, I, I am. And you'll see the son of man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is a shocker, an absolute shocker to them, because again, he is quoting, you see, Daniel. He's quoting Daniel. And they know the Old Testament very well, you see. They know the Old Testament very well. So then what do we have here? Well, this is typical. The high priest tore his garments. This is what they do when they are horrified. This is what they do when they are horrified. So he, he tears his garments. Any comments on this, what's going on right now? Okay. So. And he says then, we don't need any more witnesses. We're done with this. We're done. Listen. You've all heard the blasphemy. Yeah. They all condemned him. As deserving to die. So some begin to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him and said to him, prophesy. And the guards greeted him with blows. Comments? Okay. Peter's denial. While Peter was below in the courtyard. Now, there's a key thing here. John and Peter go to the courtyard. Here's where we get a um, an idea that John's family is somewhat influential because he gets into the courtyard. You see? So he has to be somewhat influential to get in there. And he brings Peter with him. And they're in the, in the courtyard. And this is where we have the maids come along. You see? And they question him. And Peter goes through the denial. Okay. Peter goes through the denial to where 71, he begins to curse and swear, I don't know the man. And then immediately the cock crowed a second time. And then he remembers what Jesus said to him. And he breaks down and weeps. So Jesus now goes before Pilate. As soon as morning came, the chief priests with the elders and the scribes, that is the whole Sanhedrin, held a council. Now, here's what happens. Once they decided that Jesus was to die, well, they have no law. They can't put a man to death. So they have to put this together for the state to accept this. Now, Jewish rule says that if they have decided to put a man to death, what they must do is sleep on it. So after the, the uh, events of Thursday evening, they sleep on it. And our scripture says, as soon as morning came. Now, they didn't sleep on it. They gathered around a table, let's say, and put the plan together. 
the plan that would permit or force pilot to accept this as a state offense because that's the only way they could kill him so they spent the night brainstorming as to how do they package this together so that it becomes something pilot has to take that's why it says the chief priest with the elders and the scribes the whole everybody they got together and they probably debated this how do we do this how do we put it together because they got one chance they go before pilot and they get one opportunity to get this before him and have him accept it. Any questions on this at all? Okay. So Pilate questions him. Are you the king of the Jews? He said to him in reply, you say so. What do you see about that verse? He doesn't admit it that he is. What does he say? He's just telling Pilate, you say I am. Yeah. What does that mean? Pilate is the first one to declare him the king of the Jews. Pilate says it. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, hey, you said it. Pilate's the first one to declare him the king of the Jews. Now, that's a foreigner addressing him. If the Jews were addressing him as king of, they would have called him the king of Israel. But see, Pilate's not Jewish. So he addresses him as the king of the Jews. And Jesus says, that's what she said. You did it. And so he gets accused of a lot of things. Okay, And Pilate says, have you no answer? Keep in mind what I said before. He does not have to answer. They have to prove their case. He says, see how many things they accuse you of. Jesus gave him no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Because their layer, and again, the plan they put together the night before, they're laying out all of these accusations. And Pilate's amazed. He's nothing to say. He doesn't defend himself at all. So Pilate's totally baffled by this. Now, in Scripture, Pilate is presented as a um, sympathetic figure. You know, we kind of, when you read Scripture, it doesn't matter. But when you read the history of Pilate, this man is ruthless. He is absolutely ruthless. Hates the Jews with a passion. If they said the sun was out, he'd say it's raining. You know, no matter what, he doesn't agree with anything they say or anything they do. Okay? So you have to know his history. So you read Scripture, and it sounds like, well, he's a guy, you know, he's, he's, he's a, He's kind of um, struggling with this, with this decision and whatnot. You know, uh, no, Pilate is, is, a, is pretty, a pretty ruthless guy. So on the occasion of the feast, it was customary to release a prisoner. As kind of a, just to celebrate the feast. And it would be a prisoner that they would have requ requested. And so we have a man called Barabbas. And he is in prison, along with the rebels, as Scripture says, uh, who had committed murder in um, a rebellion. So the crowd demands now that he release somebody. So he says, do you want me to release to you, look what he says, the king of the Jews. Pilate identifies him again, the king of the Jews. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Because he knew that it was out of envy that they handed Jesus over. See, they knew that it was totally out of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd. They wanted him to release Barabbas instead. 
And Pilate said to them in reply, what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Now that's in brackets. So an editor would have put that in. What do you want me to do with the king of the Jews? The title again. Now in the gospel of John, there's an interesting verse there. The gospel of John, it says, shall I crucify your king? And what do the chief priests say? We have no king but Caesar. That tells you the trial is a complete sham. They have no king but God. They never put a king in place. You see, to say that they have a king, uh, they have a king in Caesar is completely crazy, completely ridiculous, because they don't. They don't. And that's what John adds. John adds that, you see, in his. So when Pilate says, what do we do? What do they say? Crucify him. Now, Pilate is stunned at this. As a matter of fact, in the movie, The um, Passion of the Christ, I think this, this scene before Pilate is, is very well done because he's stunned. He's absolutely stunned. He says, why? What evil has he done? And they just shouted louder, crucify him. So Pilate figures, well, I'm going to send him out and have him scourged. He releases Barabbas. Okay, which is interesting. The, the name Barabbas means son of the father, uh, which is an interesting, an interesting uh, play on words there. But to satisfy them, he releases uh, Barabbas to them. And he has Jesus scourged. And figures, this should be enough. And again, in that particular movie, uh, I like that scene because when they bring Jesus out to Pilate, he's stunned at how badly he is scourged. And he figures, well, this should satisfy them. So, so the soldiers behind the scenes, though, before that scene takes place, our scripture says, they led him away inside the palace or the praetorium and assembled the whole cohort. Now, that's important because a cohort isn't just a half a dozen people. Okay. A cohort is 480 legionnaires, six centurions, 24 junior officers, and anywhere from 60 to 100 slaves or servants that would get them whatever they need this is a crowd of people and as i've said before in many of the movies that we see with um the crucifixion we see this handful of a crowd there's a lot of soldiers here it says a cohort that's 480 soldiers alone you see now the interesting thing there is jesus is one man what were they so afraid of that they had to have over 500 people there to contain him? And so the soldiers then, it's, it's playtime. They clothe him in purple. Purple is royal fabric. Whenever you see any uh, paintings or pictures of saints and they're, they're uh, in purple clothing, that's, that's a high royalty, you see. And they weaved a crown of thorns and they put it on them. So now it was playtime for them. Hail, King of the Jews. See what they're doing. They're picking up the title Pilate gave them. Hail, King of the Jews. And when they were done playing their games, what did they do? Well, they put his own clothes on him. They stripped him of the purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. Now picture this, you know, because it happens also when he goes to the cross. His body is beaten and bloodied. You put cloth on an open wound and let it sit for a few minutes and pull it off. And how do you think it feels? The pain is excruciating. 
And this goes on with him to the cross because they left him in his own clothing to walk to the cross. So by the time he got to the cross, that cloth, that his garments, okay, have dried on his body. And when they ripped him, those clo the clothing off, the pain was excruciating. Plus, he's still suffering from the blood going into the sweat glands, the pain from that. That's so painful. If you just blew on it, you couldn't stand the pain. That's how bad that is. And it's, it's called hematidrosis is the, is the medical term that, that uh, Luke uses. And again, just the slight breeze, just the slight breeze is extremely painful. So we head off to the way of the cross. And they pressed into service Simon, this Cyrenian, who's coming in from the country. They're assuming he's coming in for the Passover. Right. He's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, in the future in history, we see that Alexander and Rufus become Christians. Doesn't say anything about Simon, but it's very possible that he did as well. So what was happening here is that the bodily injury that Jesus had gone through was so severe that he could barely take a step. As a matter of fact, he probably passed out numerous times on the way to the cross. We show in our stations of the cross that he fell three times, but there are writings there that say he could have fallen 35 times because he basically he had no strength. He hadn't eaten since the night before. He had no fluid, no nothing at all. He's beaten to a pulp, and he has to carry this cross, probably carried the beam, not the whole cross, because the whole cross, as we see it in artwork, that would have weighed about 325, 350 pounds. And he would not have been, no one would have been able to carry that. Secondly, to create that type of cross took a lot of creative handiwork to do it. The crosses in the day were, in the ground was a, um, uh, uh, a stake, all right? And the cross beam would fit over the stake, you see? So it is believed that he carried the cross beam. Also, when you look, if you accept the Shroud of Turin as the burial cloth, you will notice on the cloth, the one shoulder is very badly bruised. So it's believed he carried the beam on his shoulder, which would have been heavy enough. But as I said, the uh, when you read some of the Franciscan writings, they believe that he would have fallen many, many, many times. And so they were afraid that he was going to die before he got to the cross. And that's why they pull Simon in to pick up the cross and help him carry it. Otherwise, they were fearful that he would have died. So they brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated the place of the skull. Now, the interesting thing about that, if you, you can Google this and find uh, some photography, if you look at some of the photography as the sun is passing over Golgotha, it actually looks like a skull at some times in the evening. You'll see the two caves, which are the two sockets of the, the eyes and the nose. It looks just like a skull. So it was called the place of the skull. And they take him there to be crucified. Now, also, when you see artwork of the crucifixion, you may see the cross, and at the bottom of the cross is a skull and crossbones, which is kind of odd to see. However, when you go to the Holy Land, you will see that Jesus was crucified right above the tomb of Adam. And that's what the skull and crossbones references. And if, if the artwork is done properly, you will see the blood dripping down the cross onto the skull and crossbones, which means Salvation was for everyone going all the way back to the beginning, Adam and Eve. Any questions on what we're talking about so far? I know we're moving along without a break today, but there's a lot to cover. If you need to refresh your coffee or do something, whatever, please do. But there's so much I wanted to get this in because this uh, being Holy Week, this is just really powerful for us to understand what goes on, what's going to go on this week, all right?
And so he gets there and they gave him, Mark says, they gave him wine drugged with myrrh. Now, this is typical. Okay, In other words, myrrh would have deadened the pain. So this was typical. Why do they want to deaden the pain? They wanted crucifixion to be um, uh, extended. They wanted the pain and the humiliation to be extended. And so by giving the person who was to be crucified this, this drug, they would live a bit longer. And keep in mind, they wanted this to happen because they wanted to pe the people to see this. Because this is the way that the Romans communicated to them that if you break the law, this is what you get. If you break the law, this is what happens. So they wanted this to, to um, uh, last longer. Okay. So then they crucified him and they divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. Again, this is a prophecy being fulfilled. And Mark tells us it's nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read the king of the Jews. Now, this is kind of interesting. The king of the Jews, as I said before, the word Jews was only used by foreigners. They didn't say the king of Israel. Okay, So it's kind of ironic. You know, um, uh, the Magi used it too. But when Pilate wrote that, Again, remember what I said before, he can't stand them. And he writes the king of the Jews. They go crazy. You have to change that. You can't write that. He's not king of the Jews. And Pilate says, scripsy, scripsy. In other words, I wrote what I wrote. I'm not changing anything. I wrote what I wrote. That's it. Now, what was typical of the day is the, the, um, the uh, guilty person would carry that plaque around their neck as they marched off to where they were going to be crucified. So everybody could see the crime. So he has this, you know, king of the Jews around his neck. Meanwhile, the Jews are going crazy because that's not what they want at all. But Pilate's not changing anything. And that's because, remember what I said, Pilate can't stand them. Just can't stand them. He's going to do exactly opposite. But here again, that's very, very important because from the very onset, Pilate declares him king of the Jews. Right to the plaque that he writes that's going to hang above the cross. This is the king of the Jews. Any questions or comments on that? Okay. So with, yes, Amy. Why do you think Pilate was kind of the sympathetic character here and the one like that's calling it out? Is it just to show that it was the Jews that that were pushing for the crucifixion? Or, you know, is there any or or is he just so well known as as the like uh, merciless man that he is that he didn't need anything? You, you no, know, well, what I mean? like he didn't need called out. Pilate had been known for um, having uprisings with the Jews and putting them down in a very uh, fearful way. When he came into Jerusalem, he carried what they called emblems. In other words, he carried images of the emperor in, not done. And the Jews went crazy to the point that the emperor said, take them out. Okay, you know, don't do that. You know? So the emperor was sensitive to Jewish traditions. You know, and Pilate a couple of times really incited them. One time he actually uh, used money that was for the temple to build an aqueduct, which incensed them. Another time uh, he had his soldiers uh, go through the crowds with daggers hidden in their clothes. And when they were given the signal, they murdered them. You know, So he's known for this. What happens in this particular situation is what the Jews are accusing Jesus of makes no sense. Keep in mind, Pilate's not a Jew, so he doesn't understand Jewish traditions or whatever, or these blaspheming or whatever. He, he doesn't find anything. 
He listens to what the to what they say. They just want him crucified. But he's not finding a crime. So even though they package this so the state would take it, the only thing that trips the trigger is that they tell him point blank, if you don't do this, right, the emperor is not going to be happy. Now, he's been put on notice by the emperor a few times so that if a bad note goes to the emperor about him, he's out of here. That's what trips this, you know. So he's finding nothing. Whatever the all, all the accusations and whatnot, he just doesn't see any need for this level. He may see a need for um, a punishment of some sort, but he doesn't see need for the level of what they're asking for. In other words, they haven't proven their case to him at all. It's when they make reference to the emperor that all of a sudden, no, wait a minute. He becomes concerned then with his own political position. Now we're talking, right? Now this is a, this is going to uh, uh, affect me and my political position. And so now he hands him over. But through all of this, we see this sympathetic figure because what when you read the Passion, what, if you read all three, what you see is that this trial is a complete sham. They're bringing accusations. They're not bringing the accusations the way the law says to bring them. In other words, if I'm going to accuse you, I have to have somebody else that has the same accusation. I just can't come up and say, you know, oh, Amy did this. You know, you know what are you backing this with? You see, at no time does any do any stories match. You see, no. So, but that's in the Sanhedrin group. When they package this up and take it to Pilate, Pilate's looking for a crime. You see, but the crime that they have is blasphemy. Man, Pilate's not relating to that at all. Show me a crime against the state. What did he do against the state? You see, that's why it goes back and forth. And he figures, well, if I have him scourged, that should take care of this. And they scourge him to the nth degree. However, it doesn't satisfy the Jews. And it's only when they flip it and make reference to the fact that Ah, the emperor, you know, and then Pilate sees his own uh, position is now in jeopardy. So that's what that that's what turns him. That's what turns this. And what he does, he washes his hands of it. But he says, "That's it. Do what you want." He hands him over. See, he hands him over to them to do what they want. So it's almost ironic because it points it puts that juxtaposition in that like he would have been the first in line to crucify a Jew because he, you know, it was no skin off his back because he didn't like them anyway. And he's the one that's actually saying, like, it's almost pointing out that what are you crucifying him for? You know, like what what charge are you bringing? That's true. That's exact. As a matter of fact, he goes to the Antonia Fortress during the um, Passover time. Because that's when, as I said, there's, there's millions of Jews there, you know, so he, he, he wants to be there. So, and, and that's where they would hold court uh, again if anybody broke the law. And this is not a small building, by the way. This is a massive building. And it's a palace. So he goes there with his family and his relatives and whatever. But he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be there at all because he just doesn't want to, he wants to be back. He wants to be back in his own place. He doesn't want anything to do with the Jews. Yeah, you know, so he's completely out of the picture as far as that goes. Um, and again, I like I like out of all the movies that I've seen, The Passion of the Christ um, portrays some of these scenes very accurately. I think because when you see him even talking to his wife, he's saying point blank, like I hate uh, I hate being here. Can't wait till we're out of here. He's just so aggravated the, that he has to be there. You see, so some of those scenes uh, are. I think they're pretty accurate uh, as far as that goes, just looking at the emotions and especially with the scourging of Jesus, the shock that he sees when he brings him out. And yet they still want him crucified, even after what you see, what he looks like, they still want him crucified. But it's only when his own position is threatened that he passes it off and and gives it gives it to them, gives Jesus to them. OK, so again, there's a lot going on there. And having studied Pilate at length is where I'm able to tell you that this is a ruthless man. This is not 
you know, the pilot of scripture seems to be a sympathetic, you know, you know, and I'm not saying that it's wrong. Uh, when I view, when I read the scripture, what I'm saying is this is a man who um, has a person presented to them for a death sentence and he doesn't see it. He does, doesn't see it. They haven't proven their case. But it's only when he's threatened that he becomes a coward and passes him off. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So again, the inscription, the king of the Jews, and these two revolutionaries. Now, in your scripture, uh, verse 28 says, scripture omitted from early times, All right? Apparently, there was a writing in there in early times that was determined that it shouldn't be there, and it was removed. Okay. It was removed. That's what that note means there. Okay. So now you have um, Jesus on the cross. We have the nine o'clock in the morning, gives us the time. We have the inscription, the King of the Jews. Okay, that's one title that he's given. As um, as it goes on, we have this this ridiculing Jesus. Uh, um, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, you know, uh, making fun of him. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. Okay. And the chief priests with the scribes, everybody's mocking him among themselves. He saved others. He can't even save himself. Now, mind you, if you look back in scripture, Jesus just raised Lazarus from the dead. That's why I said when I, when you really read scripture, this just happened. And they're saying this to him. You know, what are they missing here? There was so it shows that there was nothing that Jesus could have done that was going to change their thought process. He's healed the sick, he's restored sight to the blind, he's restored hearing, he brought Jairus' daughter back to life, he raised Lazarus. And now they're saying, what else you got? Got something else? Show us. Come down from the cross. Now, again, watch the title. We just said that um, they made reference to uh, the king of the Jews. And they, they crucified two bandits. Now we see another title come out. Okay. Let the Messiah and then another title, the King of Israel. They're throwing these heavy royal titles at him. They're doing it. So we have the King of the Jews. Now we have the Messiah. Let the Messiah, let the King of Israel now, so the nation accepts him, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Always looking for a sign that we may see and believe. And the two thieves abused him as well. So now, at noon, darkness comes over the whole land. Now, we don't know. This could be the entire earth. It was certainly the area that he's in, okay? Or the world as it was in those days. In other words, if you looked at a map of the world in those days, you're not going to find New Jersey, okay? You're just going to find that Middle East area, you know, the Roman Empire. That's it. That's the only map they have. So don't look for Pittsburgh or Johnstown or, or you know, wherever you live. It's not there. See, But it says it came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Now, again, if you look here, what's, what we're being told here is the prophetic fulfillment of Amos, chapter 8, verse 9. So you see, all of this is fulfillment of prophecy. And so at three o'clock, he cries out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Interestingly enough, that's Aramaic. The whole New Testament is written in Greek. This reference is made in Aramaic. And it's translated, as we said before, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's feeling the power, 
if that's the right word, or the results of sin. He's feeling this separation. And some of the bystanders heard it, who heard it said, look, he's calling Elijah. Now here's another thing. If these are so these are men so so um uh steeped in scripture, Eloi is a word for God, not Elijah at all. He's calling on God. So one of them soaks this sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait. Let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. But remember what Jesus said at the Last Supper. He will not drink of the fruit of the vine until he drinks it, the kingdom of God. And then Jesus gave out a loud cry and breathed his last. Now, this chronology that we just talked about is unique to Mark. Nine o'clock in the morning is the third hour of the day. Twelve noon is the sixth hour. Three o'clock is the ninth hour. What does this show us? It shows us that nothing is accidental. This is all um, designed by God. So Mark is very specific about the hour. We see the plan rolling forward. So the death on the cross, the entire history of salvation is wrapped up around this event. The entire history of salvation is wrapped up around the passion and death of Christ. It culminates in that. And then Jesus breathes his last. Now, here's the key. What does Jesus say in his ministry? I will let you know when I'm laying down my life, and I'll let you know when I'm picking it up. He's calling the shots. He'll let you know when it's over. Because normally, a person who was crucified would live on the cross for two days. Two and a half days. We saw that with Peter. We see that with Andrew. And they preached from the cross. No. After three hours, Jesus called the shots. And he said that. Okay. I'll let you know when I'm laying down my life, and I'll let you know when I'm picking it up again. Now, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. Anybody have any comments on that? Angela, yes. Um, that the veil in the sanctuary was actually like many inches thick and felted wool. Um, and I only know this because I talk about scriptures with my friend who's a messianic rabbi. Okay. He said the significance of this, many people miss it because you don't, you know, they they don't understand what that cloth, the veil actually was. Okay. And what did the veil do? It kept the people sep well, so only high priests were allowed to go back there. Yep. And so were... by that tearing, Jesus was opening up the gates of heaven, the kingdom of God, so that there was no more intermediaries or the people had direct access through him to God, the father. That's correct. In layman's terms, God was let loose. God was kept um, behind those curtains that Angela is talking about. That's the holy of holies. But now God is for everybody. He lets them loose. That's the reference there. God is for everyone. With the it is correct. Only the high priest can go in there once a year, okay, and 
incense and pray and offer prayers for the people. No one was permitted to go into the Holy of Holies. As a matter of fact, I might have mentioned this in a previous uh, Bible study, but uh, someone I had in one of my Bible studies years ago asked me the question as to, well, how do they clean it? So that's a good question. I had no idea. So I did some research and I found out that what they did is they had made baskets where the front of the basket was op open, the back of the basket was closed, and they would lower the guys in there so they did not face the Holy of Holies or they would die. But they, from the front, they could dust and clean and do whatever. And I found that fascinating that they had that set up because you could not look at the Holy of Holies. You were not permitted to, you see. So again, when the, the, um, the veil of the sanctuary is torn, God is for everybody now. Right? He's let loose. He's let free. He's not kept in a, a, a single room where only a few people can visit. He's out for everybody. That's what that means. Okay. Any other questions on Done. Okay, all right, we're moving right along here. So the centurion, scripture tells us that the centurion that was facing him saw how he breathes his last. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, a little other history there. Uh, there's an, uh, an earthquake takes place, okay? And they did study, and they found out that back in the day, back in that time, there was a massive earthquake that did take place. So there's actual scientific fact that this happened. So here we see the women that were looking on from a distance. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of the younger James and of Joses and Salome. Okay. And his mother, of course. And John is at the foot of the cross as well. Now, these women that we make reference to, Mark wants you to know that they followed him when he was in Galilee. And they ministered to him. So they were imp an important part of his ministry. And it says there were also many other women who had come up with him. He doesn't identify them. But there were other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So his ministry had a follower. Okay. And they were there. Well, the, these women that I mentioned by name are watching from a distance. So now, it's already evening. It was the day of preparation. It's the day before the Sabbath. And Joseph of Arimathea comes on the scene. Right? Now, he's a member of the council. He's a heavy hitter, so to speak. And it says he himself was awaiting the kingdom of God. But he goes to Pilate because, again... They have to get the body off the cross before Sabbath. So he goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. Now look at verse 44. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead because, as I said before, two days, two and a half days, you know, the, the crucifixion would, would linger, okay? So he calls a centurion centurion and asks him did jesus already die he's dead after this short period of time and the centurion says yes and he says okay fine take the body so having bought a linen cloth he took him down wrapped him in the linen cloth and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock now this is important because there's a commercial on tv running now with um, Billy Graham's son, who is standing in front of the garden tomb. You may have seen it. Um, he's standing in front of the garden, what they call the garden tomb. That's not the tomb where Jesus was buried. That garden tomb, that property was purchased, I believe, from some Protestant uh, ministers or congregations or whatever. And they tried to recreate the garden tomb as it would have been in scripture. So it's a very pretty garden, you know, and he's standing in front of it. And he says, I'm in front of the garden tomb. The, where Jesus was buried is inside the church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's where he's buried, inside that church. 
Okay, there's there's a number of stations that are inside that huge complex. That's where he's actually buried, not in what they call the garden tomb. Right? Uh, it's a very very sacred place. Um, they have now renovated. It took them years. I don't know how many years. There's a building. There's a building called the Edicule, which is a building that's uh, constructed over the to that protects it. Huge, huge building. They had been um, refinishing it for years, 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know for sure how many. But again, they cleaned off all the soot because in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, a lot of the uh, icons and things were very dark because of the candle, the candles that are burned there, the incense and whatever. And so they started cleaning it. Now, a couple of years ago when we were there, it was done and they took down all the scaffolding. And it's really quite a beautiful building. But here's some uh, interesting, you could again, you can find this on in your own research. When they got to the tomb where Jesus was laid and they lifted off the slab, all of their equipment shut down. Everything shut down. All the scientific equipment shut down. When they brought everything back up and they again cleaned everything and put it and reset it and whatnot, their equipment um, showed that there was still activity in that tomb. And that's documented. There was still some sort of activity in that tomb. And when you go to visit the tomb of Christ, it's a very small room. Uh, so they only allow like two or three people in. Uh, you can't fit any more than that. So you're in this huge church of the Holy Sepulchre and you're in line. It's one of the two places where there would be a line. One would be where Jesus was born and the other is the, the tomb. And so when you come in, you first come into this little room, which is called the Chapel of the Angel. And there's a piece of the stone that the angel was sitting on when he spoke to the women encased in glass. And you go into there first. Then you go into another little room, which is like a closet. That's the only way I can describe it, a small room. And there you have the slab covering where Jesus was laid. Now, the beauty of this in the Holy Land is that they allow you to touch things. So you can actually touch where his head was. As a matter of fact, I usually buy some crosses or some other souvenir rosaries or whatever, and I will lay them on that spot. It makes them a third class relic, but even more so to give them as a gift to someone and say this this actually was placed where Jesus' head was in the tomb. This is a powerful place to be. It's a real powerful place to be. And so, and again, the garden tomb, um, archaeologists have discovered that that's an eighth century before Christ's tomb that had been used. Scripture tells us Jesus was was laid out in a tomb that had not been used. So it was a brand new tomb. It was actually Joseph of Arimathea's tomb that he gave to Jesus. Now, again, in the Holy Land, uh, on my trips anyway, um, I get to go to these spots that aren't normally on the regular schedule. The last time we were there, we were in the uh, in the church, and I said to our guide, I know the church, the, the tomb of Joseph, the actual tomb Joseph was in, is here. And she said, yeah. I said, can we go to it? So we actually walked into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, as well as the tomb of Nicodemus that are there. You see? And Jesus was laid in um, Joseph of Arimathea's original tomb, and it was brand new. No one had ever been in it. So as I said, the garden tomb that you see reference to the archaeologists have said this is an 8th century tomb, and um, uh, it had been used before. Okay, So we know that that's not. It's about it's nice. It's a, I've never seen it because I want to go to the actual sites. That is kind of like a touristy site, so it's never been on my list to see. Uh, we go to the actual tomb itself, you know, um, but that's what's being advertised on TV. And so they then roll this stone against the entrance to the tomb to seal it so that nobody could get into the tomb. Right. Now, our last um, bit of this of Mark's gospel here, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, okay, 
watched where he was laid. So they witnessed it. They watched it very, very carefully to see where he was laid. And that ends Mark's gospel or ends Mark's passion. So as you can see, he gives us a very, very detailed uh, uh, history of events. And when you read the other gospels, right, uh, Matthew, Luke, and John, you'll see that they have added. In other words, they've they've kind of filled out the bone, so to speak, to give us even a clearer picture of some of the things that went on. All right? But Ma but Mark here is very very specific to show us the personalities and the timeline and the different events that took place uh, from the time Jesus was at the Last Supper, okay, until the time that he laid in the tomb. And so the beauty of the story here is, and again, when you look at, um, at the way I wrote my book, the passion begins in a garden and it ends in a garden. That's called bookends when you write like that, it's bookends, right? It's called an inclusio. You're writing in an inclusio style. So you have one book end and he opens in the garden and it closes in the garden, but a lot of stuff goes on in the middle. So it's like bookends, you see? And that's the writing style, you see? And that's what you see with Mark as well. He starts there and he ends in the tomb, okay? That's, that's in the garden.